Hello everyone and welcome back, Dace here. So here's the big question of the day. When you think about STGs from the 80s, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Is it a specific title? Is it the more rudimentary way games were made back then or how punishing they could be? For me, I think about the simple design many of them possess and how unforgivingly fast enemy projectiles are. Quite often, attacks that feel too simple to mess up end up claiming more lives than we'd like until we really know the lay of the land, so to speak. It's not that there weren't games with interesting systems in place, it's just that they feel few and far between. So whenever I stumble upon an STG that does throw some fascinating things into the mix, it's that much more refreshing. And that's why I want to share a little bit about Gemini Wing today, because it's one of those classics that I feel offers a truly unique experience for players. With that out of the way, let's get into this. Gemini Wing is a 1-2 to two player vertical scrolling arcade shooter created by Tecmo in 1987. It eventually received home conversions for Amiga, Atari ST, Amstrad CPC, Commodore 64, MSX, X68000, ZX Spectrum, and PlayStation 4 and Nintendo Switch as part of Hamster's Arcade Archives series. That being said, I'll be reviewing the Switch version. The story follows one or two high-tech craft fighting against insect-like alien creatures that are invading the planet. Gemini Wing consists of seven stages played over a single loop. During the run, you'll fly over detailed and breathtaking landscapes that feel like you're really seeing this world in all of its glory. There is a wide variety of enemies, and I feel like the challenge is more about learning their movements and not so much about the shots they fire. There is certainly never a dull moment in G-Wing. I'll list some of the enemy types when touching on the stages themselves. The bosses, on the other hand, could definitely offer a little more in the way of challenge, but for a game from the 80s, I'm not really complaining. Besides, where they drop the ball, or in Gemini Wing's case, the gun ball, they make up for it by bringing a lot of presence to the fight. The player's craft is equipped with a double-shot pea shooter. This default weapon cannot be upgraded, so players will need to time their shots and exercise greater accuracy for the length of the run. Despite a fairly lackluster main weapon, we have items called gun balls at our disposal. These items are obtained from specific enemies and grant the player unique abilities including extra lives, speed ups, point bonuses, and single use special attacks. The most effective offensive gun balls are the fiery screen clearing wave that travels up the length of the screen, the blue colored rings that fire in a large expanding circle, or even the fire beam that moves back and forth, which is great when you want to create some breathing room. Some examples of the not so effective gun balls would be the green homing missiles or tri shot. The enemies that carry gun balls will trail these items behind themselves as they fly around the screen. You can shoot these foes to change the type of gun ball they carry, or at least until you've dealt enough damage to destroy them. Once destroyed, they drop the gun balls and players may retrieve them. Furthermore, you can steal gun balls without killing the enemies if you can get close enough to grab them, but this is risky since there's an increased chance you'll get hit by an enemy or bullet. When you have multiple gun balls trailing behind your ship, the closest one to the craft is what will be fired off first. Since we can intentionally select the order for these items, we can essentially strategize if we want to go that route. Otherwise, it's just as fine grabbing whatever and firing them off in the order you have. If you lose a life during a two-player game, your ship will drop all gun balls, but the second player can retrieve the items if you don't get them in time. In addition to avoiding enemies and bullets, players will need to pay close attention to their surroundings, since many sections include environmental hazards. Let's take a closer look at each stage. The journey begins high in the clouds where we encounter numerous winged aliens. We eventually fly along the length of a deep canyon with an old rope bridge and cave-dwelling worm-like creatures with tentacles. Not long after this, we come to a large waterfall where we fight a giant walrus amidst the thundering water. Unlike many STGs that have a transition screen between levels, Stage 2 begins scrolling immediately after the Stage 1 boss fight. We fly over and away from the waterfall and reach a dense evergreen forest with one-eyed tree aliens. A crisp blue river winds its way along the land, and we cross over a deep dark crevice before moving to a grassy cliff ledge. I especially love this part because there is a clear blue lake and another thick forest far below. It gives off an exhilarating feeling when you see this pristine natural world facing such an immense threat as wave after wave of enemies flood the screen. Stage 2's boss is actually two one-eyed creatures that come out of a mountain and shoot thick laser beams. After defeating them, the mountain explodes, revealing a large tunnel opening which we enter to begin the next stage. In stage 3, we fly along the length of the tunnel facing enemies and various hazards, including dense patches of sand that must be blown away, and vines that grow across the screen. 
Players may shoot these vines to eliminate them temporarily, but they'll continue to grow a moment later. One trick for having an easier time with these plants is first letting them cross entirely. Once they have done so, they will solidify and may then be blown apart without the risk of them growing again. Stage 3 does not end with a boss fight. Instead, we exit the tunnel and find ourselves high above the ocean. Stage 4 has us entering a stormy area filled with dark clouds. This is a really neat level because flashes of lightning create this great silhouette for the enemies. We leave the storm behind near the end of the stage, and this is where the boss reveals itself. At first, a shadow below the water appears, and before long we are faced with a large brain-like monster that shoots fireballs and smaller bullets. Stage 5 has us entering fluffy clouds where we fight against alien bat-like creatures and loads of insectoids. Partway through the stage, we reach the front of a sizable airship with turrets and swarms of enemies. Once players make it to the end of the ship, it comes alive with eyes that fire nasty shots, and this boss also launches spinning skulls. Stage 6 is fairly abstract. The background looks like it could be an ice field or something. Large pointed rocks stick out of the surface, and we eventually make our way through an area with giant snapping vines. After carefully navigating this treacherous zone, we reach a cramped, rocky cave for the boss fight. The boss is a long centipede that hides away and changes its position using multiple openings. After beating the boss, its body explodes and flames burst from the holes as we fly onward for the final level. Stage 7 takes place within a blue-colored tunnel with a ribbed appearance below. We're served a severe dose of enemy waves and hazards, such as flames that scorch the screen's width, more vines, and sand patches. Assuming we make it to the end, we must move through a very cramped passage to reach the final boss's chamber. Oddly enough, this boss fight is one area where the game doesn't shine as brightly as other parts. In this fight, we are confronted by a large dragonfly-type creature, which I feel looks pretty cool. It fires a couple types of shots, including what looks like banana slices. This boss has a very slow routine that doesn't lend us many opportunities to damage it. Its weak point is the tip of its tail, but its tail has a protective covering, so players must wait for it to be exposed before they can do any damage. The tail's tip does not have a hitbox, so you can move your ship directly over top when it's safe to do so and unleash your attacks. Eggs are launched around the area, and destroying these will reveal a random gunball. Skilled players who know what they're doing can take the boss down in two minutes, but some players have mentioned they've been in the fight for up to 15 minutes before finally killing it or losing their last life and needing to start over. I feel this fight is lacking for a few reasons. Firstly, the entire game is action-packed, and this battle doesn't feel like it fits in with the momentum that builds throughout the run. I think it would have been awesome to have a more aggressive boss and one that you could damage normally. The second reason is that most of the time, you're just avoiding the attacks while waiting for eggs to launch. With how limited our opportunities are for dealing damage, I wouldn't blame anyone for not wanting to attack the tail without gunballs. But if you're out of gunballs, then this is where the waiting for eggs, and sometimes completely missing them, can feel like a slog, but one you need to handle very carefully. When you finally bring down the boss, its body is destroyed with multiple explosions. The player's bonus scores are revealed, and then the credits roll. We watch a scene of the ship flying in a blue sky with white clouds before it transitions to a beautiful sunset with a castle in the background that stands tall at the top of a grassy hill. Our ship flies to the castle, and the game ends. The scoring in Gemini Wing is interesting. Aside from simply killing enemies to score points, there is a subtle system in place that will likely not be apparent unless you have invested some serious time with Gemini Wing or heard about how it works from someone else. In a nutshell, the entire run has a queue of enemies, so the faster you kill them, the more enemies get their turn to spawn. For example, a novice player may spawn a particular enemy or wave of enemies in Stage 2 that an expert player spawns in Stage 1, simply due to the fact that they are killing more efficiently. There is also a clear bonus or fortune bonus, as it's called, based on how many lives and gunballs you still have by the end of the run. The music in Gemini Wing is certainly wonky, but fascinating to hear. There are some sections where you might not even comprehend what you're listening to until it finally gets further into the track. But for the most part, I enjoyed the novelty of it all. The sound effects are a dead giveaway to the game's age, but they don't get tiring. Everything fits perfectly with the look and feel that Gemini Wing offers. In conclusion, Gemini Wing won't be for everyone, but it's a great game if you're a fan of old-school STGs, and I'm definitely glad to have this in my collection. The gunball and enemy queue systems create a unique blend that keeps things feeling fast-paced and on edge every step of the way. The backgrounds are excellent and really push the game's overall feeling, plus the sheer enemy variety is top-notch. Like I said earlier, there's never a dull moment. 
Anyway, that brings this review to an end. Let me know in the comments what you think of Gemini Wing. Is this one you played way back, or maybe you're now interested in checking it out yourself? If you enjoyed this video, please consider flinging a like my way and subscribe so you don't miss out on our upcoming shmup sing-alongs. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.